You know, I was saying to my family the other day, I was like, you know, you hope and pray things get that busy and crazy. (laughs) And when they do, you really can't complain because that's what you always wanted it to be like. Hi, Mamuna. How are you? Hi, Javeria. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I am very excited for our conversation today. Thank you so much. And likewise, I'm just looking forward to it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your background and what inspired you to do this work. Okay. So uh, basically, I'm an international medical graduate. Um, I graduated from Dow Medical College in Pakistan and did my post-graduation in Ireland. I'm based in Dublin, Ireland. And for last um, 10 years, I've been involved in clinical education of medical students in both the undergraduate and the graduate entry medicine programs. Um, So I've been heavily involved in training them in clinical skills and assessing them, examining them in, in the same. Besides this, Uh, I have a background in software development from many, many years ago. In fact, uh, interestingly, I started my med school journey and the software development education at the same time. Uh, In the evenings after my med school, I used to drop off at a computer institute near my place and uh, learn how to code there. Um, Started off with graphic designing, then to utilize that skill, learned how to build websites and the little bit of coding that I started to learn for website development intrigued me so much that I ended up uh, learning .NET technology, which was actually launched that very year by Microsoft. Um, So yes, I had actually pioneered a medical e-learning solution as a medical student. Yeah. I was in um, towards the end of my second year med when I had launched this platform called Med and Bytes, which was uh, for e-testing. Uh, so uh, an e-learning website with both the testing service and Digital Learning Resource Center. And back in those days, and this is about 2002, there was no YouTube. So all the live video uh, I posted on the Digital Learning Resource Center for various clinical skills were highly appreciated by um, my colleagues and fellow students. Um, That was nice. We didn't um, design it as a business. It was free of cost, uh, available to anybody belonging to healthcare profession. And I had a team of volunteers, wonderful volunteers, my uh, fellow students from the college uh, helping me out on their journey. Um, So, yeah, that was an amazing experience. Um, And then fast forward to the COVID-19 pandemic. I was trying to maximize clinical exposure for my students on the wards because they were not being allowed on the wards during the major lockdowns um, and the clinical placements were affected. And while using traditional video platforms, after many years, I wore that software development uh, hat again and started to think that, yes, fine, we are using um, a platform which is allowing us to do live video calls. And, you know, it, it served us really well during that very tough time. But what are the features which would make a platform purpose built for clinical skills training? Because what I could envision at uh, envisage at that particular point in time was pandemic was to get over at some point but one thing wasn't going back and that was telehealth and it's a shame it took this world a pandemic to unleash the potential of telehealth uh, and remote which, work right yes both likewise both yeah. likewise and i will come to that part of of, of remote work very soon so um telehealth has grown exponentially um, during the last few years. And I was reading somewhere, it's it's estimated to be a 45 billion US dollar industry by year 2024. And the skill staff needed to run the show effectively isn't being retained or trained uh, on those lines. 
So I found my niche opportunity there as an educator and someone who is very much a part of um, healthcare fraternity and equipped with the software development skills. I put all my knowledge domains together and designed a platform called Intelligence, um, which I launched as a startup in 2021. So um, it's a fully customizable platform which can be customized to any healthcare discipline. And uh, because it is fully customizable, it can even be used by law schools, business schools, corporate training, because just like we need trained telehealth care service providers, we need trained people who are working in remote workforce equipped with, um, I tend to call it as teleskills training. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, um, if the employers are satisfied that their workers are well trained and well able to work remotely and deliver on you know what whatever the key deliverables are then there would be um what i should say the support for remote work to continue and it should continue mm -hmm. for so many reasons um most importantly of it being able to engage with workforce such as women and even men who cannot engage with full-time clinical work or long commute works, uh, work arrangements um, due to maybe family reasons or even health reasons or whatever. So it's a it's a great uh, facility to have to be able to work remotely, be it in healthcare or non-healthcare domains. Yeah. So how is your platform different from Zoom or any other competitors? <laughs> so um, technically. Um, Zoom or Teams, none of them were designed for training and assessment. Um, and then there is one more, pla uh, as, uh, one more, I wouldn't call them competitors and why they are not competitors. I, 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 I would love to talk about that too. I'm often asked, why not just use telemedicine solutions that are deployed at various hospitals to teach medical students? And my answer to that is there are brilliant telehealth solutions out there, hundreds and thousands of them. I definitely did not reinvent the wheel, but all of them are for service delivery. They're not for training and assessment. And the piece that I have worked on and I've nailed using my educator experience uh, was mm -hmm. the training and assessment bit of it. So telehealth service providers would actually essentially be the strongest collaborators for us, yeah. potential collaborators, you know, and uh, uh, I wouldn't tend to call them competitors. So yes, it is basically the training and assessment part because no training is complete without assessment. So basically on intelligence, it is a purpose-built platform with structured training environment. And then it is coupled with an assessment piece, which is again, fully customizable from scratch, be it any healthcare or educational discipline. So, and also it can integrate with digital medical devices. It can capture data from patient wearables. Um, so it has all those sophisticated features to allow a synchronous real-time engagement between patient students and in the presence of a qualified tutor who facilitates the session and gives a very structured feedback at the end. Sounds great. Very inspiring. Um, what is your current state of development, Mamuna? So we are past proof of concept and um, we have validated it across various healthcare disciplines, including medicine, advanced nurse practice. Um, we have users from uh, physiotherapy who were actually our very first uh, customers, uh, School of Physiotherapy here in Ireland. And then um, we have um, a confirmed pilot in a, at a School of Pharmacy. So these are the four healthcare disciplines. And we actually did a pilot with Physician Associate uh, program as well. So um, these are the healthcare disciplines where we have um, already validated um, the, the concept and the product. And what we are currently exploring is its use case in global health. And also it's used uh, by clinical research organizations in training of research investigators, so that before they go on to doing basic things like 
um, taking consent from participating patients um, for clinical trials, they can actually train these investigators um, in the uh, consent taking process. The more effective the consent, the, the, the more um, uh, compliant patients would be in the in, in the clinical trial uh, trials. We believe so. Um, that those are the use cases we are um, currently exploring. Apart from healthcare. Uh, we also have a confirmed pilot at a school of business here in Ireland. So we are looking into both healthcare and non-healthcare simultaneously. What are some of the challenges um, or obstacles that you faced? Uh, there's, there's, there's a similarity in one thing which connects all of the challenges I've faced so far um, is institutional bureaucracy. <laughs> So when I started this journey, I was asked by uh, business mentors a few times, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, because you will be dealing with one of the most difficult customer segment, because when it comes to educational institutions, it's not going to be easy. And I was like, well, this is a need. This is my vision. And I would like to see it. And then on top of everything, I've worked in some prestigious institutions um, where there are different cultures across the institutions within the same country. And it, it, this is something which is global. So I have experience from um, educational institutions as well to deploy to, to this. And I do understand what you're saying, but I would still like to do it. Uh, but Yes, that has been one challenge that despite me being aware of those challenges and me being prepared and going to those meetings well prepared, the challenges are still there. Sometimes it can be something as um, simple as someone's ego, but then that becomes a huge challenge when you want to see the point across. Uh, and then sometimes it can be just the funding or the logistics or the fact that now even though they accept and realize that, yes, it is something essential, it will be a global phenomenon, just like we teach students in bedside manners how to approach a patient in person. We will need to teach them remote patient assessment. But because things are back to in person, the level of urgency has dropped significantly. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge challenge because to sustain the business, you need to keep the revenue coming in and the interest alive. Mm -hmm. And the interest level is like they like it, they want to do it, but just the sense of urgency has dropped big time. So how have you acquired customers so far and what's your plan going forward? So uh, LinkedIn has been one of the most powerful tools for me. Um, and uh, to be very honest, most of the people I reached out to and, uh, you know, who are our current customers are all those whom I reached through LinkedIn, um, except for um, one where the school was still part of the university where I had worked. It was one of my senior colleagues who had put me in touch with them. And that particular school had telehealth in their curriculum. So when they saw it, they were using um, these traditional video platforms previously. So as soon as they saw the platform, they were like, we want to do our next telehealth module on intelligence. And they, they have used it for two years in a row. So they used our MVP, they, they, they used our second version, which in which we have cooperated user feedback from about 200 users. Um, so they used our current one as well. And um, we're looking forward to continue working with them. Yeah, how exciting. Um, so mm -hmm. what is your approach towards fundraising and maybe um, getting investments and stuff? Have you thought about that? Uh, well, that is essential to any startup, I believe. So the first one um, was um, was a grant which I was successful in acquiring from um, the local enterprise office here in in Dublin, and that's match funded. So you you first you spend and then they reimburse you fifty percent of it. So as a founder, you have to put in um, your own. Uh, funds as well, which I did. And what I did with that money was um, I using my software development skills that I had from previous years, I was able to do the wireframing and things instead of developing a prototype or spending money on the prototype. I did all of my brainstorming with senior um, colleagues and peers in, in medical education. 
using those wireframes. And I used those funds to actually develop the MVP, which was used, like we had subscriptions uh, purchased by three university programs for that MVP. So we started off with that. And then I applied for funding um, to Enterprise Ireland and we were successful. We are working with high potential startup division of Enterprise Ireland. Um, and I, I was able to get funding from them and um, go further on. Now, because I'm not from a business background myself, this was a huge learning curve for me. Um, I used that funding because that funding wasn't enough to employ people. So I used it in form in the form of consultancies and educated myself, even though I ended up doing all the work myself, because that's what happens with consultancies. You get the advice, but you have to work on your own. But I had great people advising me on various domains like pricing, branding, and like th these were very seasoned professionals. So I got the best advice and um, incorporated all of that uh, into the startup. So right now, the challenge is, that we do have customers on board, but the investors feel that this has high potential. It is something where they see that, you know, there, there is high level of growth expected, but they would like to see more traction. So I need to get more customers on board before I can get a final yes on the big investment. And startups don't have a big team. So with educational institutions, a lot of time goes into just pursuing one single program. Yeah. And then at the end, if they decide for X, Y, Z reasons not to go ahead this year, then it's your time wasted. <laughs> yeah. and, and But I guess these are the challenges we sign up for when we get on to the startup journey. But yes, now I'm preparing myself to go for the for the big fundraising so we can get some more senior people on the team and grow further. Where do you see yourself in three to five years? <laughs> so basically, uh, the way things are going at the moment, um, we are tapping into all of our customer segments. So not just the educational institutions, because, because after I realized that, you know, uh, it's going to be a very slow process with educational institutions, I started tapping into all the other customer segments from where I could establish steady revenue stream. So um, I'm looking forward to some very high potential um, collaborations and partnerships with the industry. And I really uh, hope that in three to five years time, we are able to see intelligence being used and most of the healthcare professions, education institutions um, and um, helping people to learn how to assess patients remotely. Yeah. In the end, what's the main thing that you have learned from your experience as a founder? So for intelligence, uh, one thing that has been very, very interesting and which has helped me grow um, personally and professionally is that intelligence is something which is not confined to one country or one continent even. Mm -hmm. So even as we speak, we are already in, you know, have customers or confirmed pilots here in Europe, Asia. We have reached out to people in North America. We are in talks with um, programs there um, and also in Australia. So the cross culture knowledge, cultural differences and getting to, you know, meet these amazing people online. Again, the benefits of remote work that, mm -hmm. you know, this whole um, thing has unleashed. Uh, it's just been amazing at a personal level as well. Um, and then even though there are challenges, the thing that has helped me most has been great support that I got from brilliant advisors that I have on board. And um, even though there are further more challenges for female founders in general, I think I've been very lucky in getting support from a lot of networks, colleagues, um, and um, uh, you know, senior colleagues whom I have worked with. Mm -hmm. So all of that has helped me big time. Um, alumni has been very helpful, I think, for um, any profession. That is one thing. Uh, if, if you stay connected, that does help. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes your journey uh, a little bit comfortable 
or better yeah. <laughs> because it's 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 very rough it's it is rough it is yeah. difficult so you know some words of advice some words of wisdom coming from you know um from from senior uh, professionals um, do help a lot recently we have um, actually and i th- and i feel that it has it is actually a validation in its own um our, our latest advisor on board is um dr j h sanders who is known as the father of telemedicine in the united oh. states uh, he's based in the united states and um you know it is just amazing to have him on board and him taking interest intelligence meant like a validation to me on its own yeah absolutely it sounds like um it sounds like the next three and five years are going to be very exciting for you guys yes absolutely and i'm looking forward to it you know i was saying to uh, my family the other day i was like you know you you hope and pray things get that busy and crazy (laughs) and when they do you really can't complain because that's what you always wanted it to be like so i'm really looking forward to it in the end, is there anything that I didn't ask that you would like to touch on? No, I think you have um, covered all the aspects uh, of the work that I'm doing. And I think um, I, I have to thank you actually for, uh, you know, you're your ex- exploring and you're helping others explore all the avenues for clinicians who want to explore their pathways in the non-clinical world so you know it's I, I, i'm really um glad that i got this opportunity to share my journey with other clinicians who may be exploring their pathways in the non-clinical world because there's so many brilliant ideas and talents um, out there in the medical fraternity and people may want to do things outside of their regular clinical work so thank you for doing what you are doing yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. It's encouraging to hear that the work we are doing is making a difference because um, a lot of physicians are suffering in clinical medicine. And uh, if we can show them um, a path to a better work-life balance or finding something that may be a better fit for them and where they can use their already uh, the skills they already have and utilize them to make a difference, I think. Absolutely. And how do people find you, Memona? How do they find me? (laughs) What do you, what do you exactly? Like if somebody wants to reach out and they are inspired to use your platform or they want to connect and learn more about your product. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the contact information is all out there on intelligence.com. My full name is Memona Azhar on LinkedIn. And I'll be very happy to share the link with you if you wanted to share in the bio of uh, this podcast. Uh, you're very welcome to do that. Okay. And um, uh, yes, so LinkedIn, Twitter, and my email is memuna at the rate intelligence.com. So yes, people can reach out to me on that. And I'd love to connect. Thank you again. And uh, I would love to talk to you some other time. Thank Same you so here, much. Javeria. Thank you so much. Thanks a million.